The story of Moses was an epic event revealing how God saved the Israelites from an Egyptian kingdom. What you are about to see will show that this epic event was more than good storytelling. The events in the story of Moses were precisely crafted by God's hand to foretell the coming of the Savior who would deliver the world from the kingdom of darkness. That Savior is Jesus. Prepare to be amazed as we uncover Jesus in the story of Moses. In the last video, we briefly covered how the Bible shows that the history of Moses unfolded in a specific way to prophetically foreshadow the coming Savior, Jesus. In the book of Hebrews and 2 Corinthians, we saw how just as Moses was chosen by God to save the Israelites from bondage to the kingdom of Egypt, Jesus was chosen to save the world from bondage to the kingdom of darkness. And after God used Moses to save the Israelites, they then journeyed through the wilderness until they reached the promised land. But only those who kept the faith made it to the promised land. Many were destroyed because they turned away from their savior. Now, Paul and the writer of Hebrews wrote that this was all designed to be a prophetic pattern that relates to us. Look at what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And again in verse 11, Paul says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So here Paul, he shows that the entire story of Moses was an orchestrated event that was designed to demonstrate a prophetic pattern that would repeat itself through Jesus. The event happened, but it is a prophetic pattern that will repeat itself. And that's what has happened. You see, the New Testament paints this picture showing that just like how the Israelites had to journey in the wilderness until they reached the promised land, we as believers also journey through our life until we reach the ultimate eternal promised land when Jesus returns. So when you read the book of Hebrews especially, notice how it goes into a lot of detail on the parallels between Moses and Jesus. It explains how just like Moses was the mediator of the covenant between God and his people, the Israelites, Jesus is now the ultimate mediator between God and his people. It explains how the Israelites received a temporary promised land, but we in Christ receive a promised land that will last forever. <laughs> it's all a parallel. As it reads, Hebrews 9.15, For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. So when does that happen? When do you receive this promised eternal inheritance? It happens when Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom on this earth for 1,000 years. Now, 
when Jesus returns, the angel will blow the trumpet. All eyes will see. When our Savior returns, the earth will shake. And those who are on God's side will be saved from God's wrath and will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. But those who live in sin will perish. And after that, those who have chosen to be on God's side will live forever in his kingdom, the ultimate promised land. Now, this is deep. Everything I just said is very, very deep and it's special. And this is the reason why. <laughs> because the way the Bible describes the return of Jesus is exactly the way the book of Exodus describes how Moses returned from Mount Sinai. It's amazing. You see, the scripture says that when Jesus returns from heaven or Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem, there will be a loud trumpet blast. Well, in the book of Exodus, when Moses returned from Mount Sinai, what, what, what happened? There was a loud trumpet blast. And when Moses was meeting with God, the people were complaining. Ask Aaron, could anyone live on that fiery summit for 40 days and 40 nights? Yes, by the will of God. Who knows the will of God? Do you? 32 days since Moses went up the mountain and no sign of him. Are we to wait here forever? Did we come up from Egypt to be abandoned in the desert? Yeah. Abandoned. Yeah. Then go back. Yeah. They were saying, why is he taking so long to return? Where is Moses? He said he was going to come back. What's taking so long? It's all a parallel. Because in the same way, the scripture says that before Jesus returns, the world will say, where is this coming? He promised. He said he was going to return. It's almost been 2000 years. Where is he? What is taking so long? <laughs> you see, it. It was trying to tell us this would happen in the story of Moses, that there would be a long return. And because of that, people would fall away. And when Moses finally did return from Mount Sinai, many people had turned against him. When he came and he returned to his people, those who were on God's side were told to come to him. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. Moses returned and he said, if you are on God's side, come to me. But those who had turned against him and started worshiping idols, they were destroyed. Well, in the same way, the scripture tells us that when Jesus returns, those who are on God's side will be caught up to him. They will come to him. But those who are against him, those who have turned away from him, those who have decided to go the direction of the world will be destroyed. It's all there. The entire pattern, it will be repeated. It's all laid out right there before the New Testament was even written. You see, even Jesus said that he was within the story of Moses. Notice what he said in Luke. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. You see, Jesus wanted them to know that everything written in the Old Testament, it all pointed to him. And we clearly see that just right here from the story of Moses. Paul the apostle saw it. 
And so did the writer of Hebrews and John and Jude and many of the other New Testament writers. They saw it. And Paul, <laughs> Paul, he, he saw so many prophetic parallels between the Old Testament and Jesus. In 2 Corinthians, he even mentioned this. He said that when Moses had the veal over his face after he met with God, that represented how under the old covenant there's a veil over someone's heart but in christ under the new covenant the veil is removed and we can see the truth the writer of hebrews also saw many parallels and he wrote how just as moses was the mediator of the old covenant because he brought commands from god to the people so Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. As it reads, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And Hebrews also says this. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify of the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So here Hebrews, he's just comparing Moses as a prophetic parallel of Jesus. So I think it's, it's clear at this point that when the apostles and the disciples, the followers of Jesus, when they read the Old Testament, they read it in a very special way. You see, when they read the Old Testament, they did recognize that the events within it actually happened and are great stories. Yeah. But they also read the Old Testament with a prophetic lens. And they were able to see how events in the Old Testament tied to the new and how it all linked to Christ and the future. So as believers, as people who also have God's Holy Spirit within us. As people who pray for wisdom and illumination and revelation to understand God's word, you will find that God will show you prophetic parallels in the Old Testament as well. But you have to ask and it will be given. I always say this. The Bible is the most complex, mysterious, magnificent, dynamic book that has ever existed. It has layers upon layers of prophecy and parallels that relate to the Old Testament, that relate to the New Testament, that point to our future and to our past and then link to our present. It's just mind blowing. And what I've shown right here with Moses, th this is only the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> you see, when the apostles, here, all right, let's just talk about this. When the apostles wrote about some of the prophetic parallels that they saw in the Old Testament, they didn't write about all of them. <laughs> if they had, the Bible would be about 120,000 pages long. <laughs> So if you want to see more prophetic parallels in the Old Testament and see how it relates to Christ and how it relates to the end times and the future, if you want to see that, realize that God's spirit is within you to open it up. All we have to do is ask him. For example, I mentioned how the New Testament only talks about some of the parallels between Moses and Jesus. It doesn't talk about all of them. Otherwise, the Bible would be tens of thousands of pages long. So it only talks about some of the parallels. But believe it or not, there are multitudes of other parallels and ties between Moses and Jesus that are left for you to discover as you read the Old Testament. And that's what makes it so exciting. So right here. I am going to share with you a few prophetic parallels that are not specifically mentioned by the New Testament, but you will see them if you read the Old Testament with a prophetic lens. So I'm going to mention a few here that 
are not specifically pointed out in the New Testament. And this shows really just how amazing God's word is and how it is truly a treasure that you have to dig deep into and you will pull out nuggets and jewels that you will never want to get rid of. You ready to get into this? Let's start. Okay. Remember how Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, ordered for his troops to kill the male children of God's people? Well, Moses escaped from that when he was a baby because his mother placed him in a basket and he was sent to Egypt, right? Well, what did King Herod do? The same thing. He, just like the Pharaoh, he also had a decree to kill the male children when Jesus was a baby. And how did Jesus escape from that? Just like how Moses did. Jesus also was sent to Egypt as a baby. It's amazing. They both were babies. They both escaped from a decree to kill children, the children of God, and they both were sent to Egypt. Coincidence? No. Prophetic parallel. Let's keep going. <laughs> Here's another one. When Moses began his work for God, his entire mission was to save the Israelites from slavery to the kingdom of Pharaoh. <laughs> well, Jesus said himself, that his mission is to save mankind from slavery to the kingdom of Satan. <laughs> Let's keep going. Okay. Moses left his royal status as a prince of Egypt and was willing to join the low status of his people in order to save them. In the same way, Jesus left from royalty in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, to join the low status of humanity in order to save us. Man, I love this, man. Okay, let's let's keep going. Why slow down now? Okay, check this out. Moses spent 40 days fasting on the mountain in preparation for what God would have him to do. Jesus also spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness on mountains to prepare for what God would have him to do. It's all a parallel, man. Okay, now, this one is, this is big. I'm about to share another one. This is huge. Follow me here, okay? So, Moses performed signs and wonders and the people believed in him because of it. But after he went on the mountain to meet God and he took a long time to return, the people started to turn on him. They started to wonder, where is God and where are the miracles and wonders that we saw earlier? And many of them stopped believing because they began to think that Moses would never come back. Well, in the same way, Jesus also performed mighty miracles and signs and wonders. And when he was resurrected, he went up to Mount Zion at the right hand of God. And just like in the story of Moses, many today wonder, where is Jesus? Is he coming back? Why is he taking so long? Which is exactly what the Israelites said about Moses. And many today are saying the same thing. They are also saying that, hey, we don't see a lot of miraculous signs today. We don't see people walking on water today. We don't, we don't really see a lot of the things that we saw or heard about. Where are the miraculous signs? And that's exactly what the Israelites said. They said, we saw all these miraculous signs, but now we're out here in the wilderness. We're not seeing a lot of stuff like this. Moses has left us. We don't know when he's coming back. And they turned on him. In the same way, 
Jesus said that the wicked generation before his return would say the same thing. They would say, where is his return? And they would say, we want to see signs. We want to see wonders. But Jesus said that the wicked generation will demand a sign. But the only sign that they will be given is the sign of Jonah. And the sign of Jonah refers to his resurrection and his return. Jesus was telling them, the sign that will be the greatest of all signs will be when I am resurrected and when I return. But friends, we better be on his side before that happens. You want more? Let's keep going. Another prophetic parallel. When the Israelites turned away from God and worshiped idols, Moses asked God to forgive them. And when Moses was talking with God, he even offered his own life for the salvation of his people. <laughs> well, in a similar way, when Jesus went to the right hand of the Father, he also offered his own life for us. But Jesus, he truly did die for the sins of the world. Oh my gosh. Look, this could go on for a long time, okay? I don't I don't want to keep you for five or seven hours. Um, so let's just do one last one, okay? One one more. It took the death of Pharaoh's firstborn son for the kingdom of Egypt to lose its grip on God's people and set them free. Well, it took the death of God's firstborn son, Jesus, to make the kingdom of darkness lose its grip on God's people and set us free. Man, it's amazing. The story of Moses foretold that it would be the loss of a firstborn son that would lead to the freedom of God's people. Man, if you do not see Jesus in this, you're not trying. Before Jesus was born, thousands of years, his entire life was predicted in the Old Testament. Look, if you're listening to this, Share this with as many people as you can. If you got to go to Facebook and post this in groups or if you have to spread this to people at your church, do what you have to do. But let, let if you have friends who don't who are not believers, let them see this. They have got to see that everything Jesus said he is, everything he prophesied that he would do. It was written thousands of years before he was born. It ain't coincidence. Excuse my bad grammar. It's prophecy. Now. There's one more thing that I should say about all of this. One more, one more thing I need to say. When you allow for God to open you up to seeing things with a prophetic lens, you will see that not only do events and circumstances play out prophetically, but you will see that also the numerical sequencing of those events have a prophetic importance as well. And that is when things get extremely heavy. Now, I cannot go into all of this right now, but in the future videos, we will cover the symbolism and parallels of numbers as it relates to prophecy, because that is when things get serious, because you will see just how close we are to the return of our savior. No one knows the day or the hour, but the season is at the door. So stay tuned because we will talk about the importance of the numbers 3, 7, 40, 120, Jubilee years, and much more. And we will also examine what the Bible says about the prophetic parallels of Jonah and Samson and Adam, King David, and many more. And at the end of this, your faith and confidence in everything Jesus said he will do will be stronger than ever before. God bless you.